Welcome to Season 4 of The Agile Brand with Greg Kilstrom, where we discuss business agility through customer experience, employee experience, and digital transformation. I'm your host, Greg Kilstrom. The Agile World Podcast is brought to you by Tech Systems, an industry leader in full-stack technology services, talent services, and real-world application. For more information, go to techsystems.com. To read more about the topics discussed on this show, you can go to my website at gregkillstrom.com and read my latest articles or get a copy of my latest book, Meaningful Measurement of the Customer Experience, now available on Amazon and other retailers. My name is Greg Kilstrom, and I'm the host of the Agile Brand Podcast. Today, we're going to talk about the future of CDPs and how composable customer data platforms point a way to how brands can utilize their data in a flexible and sustainable manner. Action IQ recently put out the Enterprise Guide to Composable CDPs, which helps shed some light on this topic. To help me discuss this in more depth, I'd like to welcome Florian Delval, Director, Technical Product Marketing Manager at Action IQ. Florian, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you, Greg, for having me today. Glad to be here. Yeah, looking forward to talking about this uh, topic with you. Uh, but why don't we start by you telling us a little bit about your role at Action IQ? Yeah, sure. I, I can tell you about, I guess, me on, on my role. So I, I've spent most of my career in the customer experience space with three very different roles in each company I joined. Um, and I have to admit that when I started, I didn't really even know what customer experience meant. Uh, but I was a software engineer in the text messaging space. Uh, and I, I knew I didn't want to stay too long uh, behind monitors coding. Uh, so I, I finally switched to a customer facing role and spent a few years architecting, deploying um, cross channel marketing platforms for organizations. Uh, and it's, it's just recently that I actually fully transitioned from the IT side to the business side by becoming a product marketer at Action IQ. My role involves very different activities and it's, it's always exciting, but I would say I have very, uh, pretty much two main focuses. Uh, it's education, uh, and seeking new opportunities. Uh, e- education because you, you certainly know we operate in a very complex space, the CDP space. And even if you think about marketing technologies, uh, it's even broader, uh, with so many vendors. Yeah. Um, on the second part, seeking opportunities, because I always love finding new places where our product can make a difference uh, on sort of organization space. Yeah, great, great. Well, um, so we're going to start here by talking about composable CDPs, and I'm going to include a link to an article you recently wrote. It's actually how I... Um, how we met, I uh, read your article and, and reached out and, and wanted to talk some more. So uh, you wrote an article for the Action IQ blog. Um, I'll put that in the show notes for some more background. But um, for, first, for those less familiar with the term, um, how would you describe what composable means? Yeah, it's, it's a great question to get things started. Um, first, for the audience that might be familiar with CDPs, but just in case, uh, CDP stands for Customer Data Platform. Um, and there are different definitions, but if I want to be neutral here, I guess I could use uh, the definition from CDP Institute, which defines CDPs as package software that creates a persistent, unified customer database, which is accessible to other systems. And now that you know about CDPs, we can certainly talk about that notion of composable. Uh, and here, Gartner is defining that idea of composable technologies as digital assets package that can deliver independent, clear, and complete business value. It's, <laughs> it's quite mouthful. So maybe <laughs> right. I'll, I'll try to translate that a little bit. Um, yeah. Um, uh, I, I like to use food analogy. I don't know if Greg, you're a foodie. A, a little bit, a little bit. Um, not, not as much as others, but, but some. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Uh, what do you think about fixed menus, like testing menus? Um, you know, so I'm a vegetarian, so it's, um, it's sometimes a bit challenging, but yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, for sure. So you you see, instead of paying for a fixed menu where you get exactly what the restaurant wants to serve you, the idea of composable means that you you can pick and choose your meal yourself from that menu. So you're not forced into that testing menu. Um, um, yeah. And so Garner estimates that, you know, within the next three years, 60% of organizations will invest in composable enterprise technology. So it's, it's not a small shift. It's actually a pretty big shift on change. Um, and the other thing I would add is prepackaged CDPs were created at a time where the majority of data warehouses 
we're still on premise and they're meant to support analytics workloads, not customer experience workloads. Yeah. But that, that part is, is not true anymore. So with composable CDPs, you can complement your existing investments without being forced in duplication within your stack. Yeah, yeah. And that, um, the, the number that you uh, definitely, I've seen similar things about the growth of, of composable and just the, the in investments in it. And, you know, this certainly presents an interesting alternative to those, you know, all in one, uh, whether it's an all in one cloud platform or just, you know, some of these very large systems that try to do um, a little bit of everything to, you know, sometimes to varying successes. And even to some of the other, I think there's about, uh, there's over 160 CDPs or at least platforms calling themselves CDPs out there on the market. Uh, what are some of the challenges that non technical marketers face that a composable CDP might help them solve? Yeah, definitely. So on, on your first comment on the um, alternatives, yeah, it's it's definitely an alternative to like all-in-one marketing clouds such as Adobe, Salesforce, on, on the traditional prepackaged CDPs on the market. Uh, these vendors very usually requiring you to buy everything instead of what you need. So imagine, for example, you have a, uh, you have to pay for a free course meal when you already had an appetizer earlier, or maybe you have a different place in mind for dessert. Yeah. Uh, and another challenge is being forced into copying data from your source of truth uh, into these business applications. We can chat about this uh, uh, later, but I really see a future where there would be less copies and a lot more control access on that data. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And going back to your, your question of, um, on non-technical marketers, I find it fascinating because I see composability as an opportunity to give a uh, choice for IT. But I don't think you should take, I mean, take a step back from helping business. Um, I've seen some vendors who, you know, are suggesting to unbundle the CDP. But what it means is providing a SQL interface back. Uh, and not allowing business users to, to leverage that. Like we know that business users are not SQL experts. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so I guess my point here is you want to give optionality, but you don't want to do that at the cost of the experience on operations for business users. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. And so how about, um, in addition to the, the non-technical, what about the, those technical? So those, those engineering and IT professionals, how does composable CDP help them and the work that they're often asked to do to support a marketing team or a CX team? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Taking a step back, uh, when we look at the situation, IT spends millions to centralize data in, in modern cloud data lakes. So Snowflake, Databricks, BigQuery, just to name a few. Um, and the last thing that IT wants is to be forced to duplicate that data into every business application. And that's, that's pretty much the way it works today. Um, you, you don't want that, that investment, that centralization to be, to be thrown away by immediately bringing back the silos by duplicating data into some single delivery channel tools, like an email provider, an SMS provider, et cetera. Like a, a, a way again, trying to translate this is imag imagine you're creating a pr perfect meal, like with a balance of flavors, but somehow when you have visitors at your restaurant, uh, they have a small plate, so they can only put some of that uh, meal you prepared, some of those ingredients in their plate. They certainly won't benefit from what you created initially, from that mix yeah. of flavors. Uh, and they yeah. what it means is they won't be satisfied with their meal. So, so yeah, um, yeah. Um, you know, if I, if I keep going on that food analogy for another minute, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm all in on that uh, today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, go with it. <laughs> 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 so let's imagine you're you're at a restaurant uh, and IT is providing the ingredients. So it's we'll say it's the equivalent of your customer data. And you have appliances which represents your your business applications here for marketing to prepare meals and serve them to customers. If you need a new gas range, you shouldn't be forced to also buy a fridge and buy a microwave. Like you should have the choice to just take what you need. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, on the same way, like uh, IT needs to have control over these ingredients. Uh, if if it's duplicated everywhere, they might forget about produ fresh produces, which would be in a corner uh, of a space. 
they would perish and eventually be used to prepare a meal by by the marketing team by accident. Yeah, yeah, and, no, I'll, I'll like yeah. And and I have one more for you. It's it's really you want to be able to add items on the on your menu to be able to expand revenue opportunities. So really, uh, at the end of the day, if I try to summarize, like I see composable CDPs as a fourfold benefit. It's, it's choice, control, agility, and innovation. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. And yeah, I think the, the, the metaphor helps, uh, helps, definitely helps, helps paint that picture to use a different metaphor. <laughs> so <laughs> um, <laughs> nice. So for those um, that haven't quite moved in this direction yet, I mean, as you, as you mentioned earlier, there's a lot of companies that are moving in this direction, but for those are, that are learning more, that are trying to make a move in this direction, what are, what are some of the things that are required in order to make a move to a more composable customer data stack? Yeah, that's that's another great question. Um, I'm going to move away from the food energy for a minute. <laughs> sure. But I'm going to talk about my home, actually. Uh, yes. I, mortgage rates are crazy, but I, I still went ahead with my home purchase project. Um, and so if you want to improve your home, uh, unless you have unlimited time on budget, uh, which, which, by the way, is not my case. Um, <laughs> you, Few of us have that, uh, <laughs> have that luxury, right? <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> in, in both like, like me, uh, we, have, we have to split that project into pieces. Um, and so the flooring could be one example of, of a, a piece uh, of the project. The kitchen could be another one, the bathroom, and et cetera. You, you get the idea. Yeah. Uh, and so the, the same goes with starting to compose your data stack. You need first to identify what are the components which goes into that stack. Uh, and so an example could be to have uh, an identity component. And maybe for some people, it would be even a, a couple of identity components, one for anonymous profiles, one for non-profiles. You would need another component for joint segmentation, one for orchestration. Uh, uh, and so on. So you, you can define this, this components. And the next step uh, I would recommend is look at which pains you have in your stack and start, look at the cost and operations and start with whatever would be the lowest effort with the highest impact. Yeah, yeah. And on our side, if you, if you, if you want to be even more concrete, I would say what we're seeing people start with in general is this notion of audience segmentation. Uh, and the reason for that is because it's, it's really the first step into getting the data into the end of the business to turn it into action. You know, everything before that, when you collect the data uh, and so on, it's, it's a cost center until you can put that data into action to generate revenue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And so, you know, kind of, you touched on a few things related to this, but to kind of go a little bit further here um, and to talk a little more generally about innovation within organizations. Um, you know, innovation certainly takes speed. It, it takes many other things. How can a composable approach help organizations to innovate more quickly and effectively? Yeah, so I would say, you know, until recently, uh, making a future-proof decision was all about making a decision that would be definitive. Uh, yeah. if, if you think about pyramids, they're built to stay, you know? Right. Like, it, it was really meant to be studied. But no, we're in a very different world. I would say we're more in the Lego world. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right? Where you build from blocks and the expectation is that you should be able to switch things. And so change is happening uh, and it will continue to happen whether you like it or not. So what you need is to find technology which allows you um, to apply that innovation, to insert, to change. Um, and I, I can give you an example. I'm sure you've heard about third party cookies going away at this point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I, I think everybody's familiar uh, with that. Uh, we've been talking about it for quite some time, but uh, the reality is that the use cases which are used uh, using that, that third party cookie, they're not going away. Um, and so a lot of vendors came up with uh, alternative IDs, which they called cookie-less ID. And so if I was asking you, Greg, which, like, which cookie-less ID would you adopt or how would you go with choosing one? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know enough about that to make a, to make a decision, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it probably there's, there's certainly there's privacy considerations, there's ease of use of data, there's, there's all kinds of ways to, to decide, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And, 
you know, it's it's really not simple. It's it's not a simple question. Um, yeah. The reality is, brands will choose certainly the ID which allows them to advertise where they need. On the other side, publishers will want to adopt the solution that brands will choose. So it's a little bit of chicken on the egg thing. Um, but you you can't be in that choice paralysis. You really need to pick one and start testing early. And so the challenge here is to make sure that you can do that, but without being locked in, you want to be able to change your decision in the future if you, if you need to. Um, yeah. And so again, here, the takeaway is adopting a composable stack for me, it's it's giving your organization the ability to accelerate organization uh, innovation, sorry, but without having to worry about uh, making a decision that you can't change. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, um, Let's uh, switch gears here a little bit, and let's let's talk a little bit about Action IQ, um, where where you work. Um, so, you know, as we talked about earlier, uh, there's a lot of players that are not only in the marketing technology field. I mean, you know, that's way over ten thousand players in that Martech infographic that's that's so famous in our in our circles. <laughs> Um, yeah. But there's also a lot of, of platforms, again, that, that either call themselves CDPs or, or act as, you know, as, as full CDPs. Uh, what would you say makes Action IQ stand out from the others? Yeah, for sure. So I think, first of all, um, I would indicate that Action IQ was really built for enterprise customers. Um, that should be a first step to narrow uh, the options on the market. Um, yeah. And, and then I would say that the same way we were talking during this show about providing technology for change, uh, Action IQ evolved over time to answer organization needs. So rather than looking for statu quo, we're embracing change ourselves. So without going to too to many details here, uh, we talked about composable CDPs, and I think it's a perfect example. Uh, Action IQ was built and developed at the time, uh, as we said, where data warehouses couldn't handle the load uh, required by business teams for six use cases. And so Action IQ developed a purpose-built infrastructure for this, for customer data. But now that we're um, able to see the evolution of the space, we're offering new deployment options for IT, where you can choose where data lives, where data is queried, and doing that, we're still providing a business-friendly UI for marketers. Uh, and so we really truly believe in a world where IT and business are successful without concession. On one side, you will have IT, which can increase the value on the existing investment, drive architectural decisions, keep control on their data. And on the other side, the business can get the tools they need to be successful with their CX objectives. They can reduce the customer acquisition cost, increase lifetime value, um, on, on more. So <laughs> in, in other words, I would say we believe that IT has the ingredients, great ingredients, and we provide appliances for business teams to make recipes. Uh, which will convert people reading your menu in a restaurant into customers and um, best first time customers into loyal customers coming back over and over again. That's great. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, besides composable, and you mentioned a few things just now, even, but, you know, be besides composable, where do you see the CDP market headed? Uh, what should we be expecting in the months ahead? Yeah. I, I think there's certainly a a few things we could talk about on some are, are predictions to be confirmed in the future. But the, sure, yeah. the first one I have in mind, uh, I, I love tracking about in the past couple of years is, is about the unfolding of advertising world with tech regulation changes. We, we chatted about third party cookies. Um, on over identifiers are also going away, uh, you know, but as we said, like yeah. best use cases are not going away. Uh, organizations are still looking to prospect to acquire new customers. So I think there is an opportunity here for, for solutions like ours to help brands across the entire life cycle from the very first touch points all the way to this more typical CDP use cases, loyalty and retention. And, and so we, we can certainly help reduce this customer acquisition cost. Um, and I, I have a few more predictions. I'm happy to chat about it uh, separately, not going too deep here, but all of them definitely are on this, this shift to first party data strategies. Uh, I, I really think this is what drives a lot of the changes on the market today. 
Yeah, yeah, agreed. I, I think, um, and there, as as you said, I mean, well, there's some some of the the companies have already made the decision to deprecate cookies and all that. Mm-hmm. Others are still, you know, as of as of recording this, I think what is it, 2024? Google has said, um, you know, that's that's shifted a bit, but you know, it's it's on the horizon. It's you know, it's something that it's it's not if it's it's when it's going to happen, and so definitely, I, I think it's. If it's not on a company's horizon right now, it should be um, definitely. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, um, one last question before we wrap up here. Um, what's a one? P- you've given a lot of great advice already and, and covered a lot here, but you know, what's what's one piece of advice that you would have for marketers that you know, they might be struggling to use their customer data as effectively as possible? And you know, what's a piece of advice for them uh, as they navigate the months ahead? Yeah, I, I'm going to try to keep that one short, but I, I might give two pieces of advice, actually. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> you can do two. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so the first one, I don't think you'd be surprised. Uh, it shouldn't be something you haven't heard before, but it's so critical. Uh, it's, it's whether you're on the business side or the IT side, you need to work closely with your counterparts. Um, it's, it's not about IT versus yeah. business. It's only together that will make the, the greatest difference. Yeah. yeah. On, on the second one, it's maybe less commonly shared, but it's still something I, I strongly believe in. Uh, it's making space uh, to free up time for your teams to adjust to the changes you're putting in place. I, I've seen too often organizations where they're asking teams to adapt, but they don't give any room to be able to do so. And so if, if you want to be successful, you need to give space for your team to embrace the change on these new initiatives. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love that. That's um, I think that is so. <laughs> it's timely with a lot of things I'm I work on with you know with the companies that I work on. But I think just in general, you know, I think the it's often thought of as the the technology part is the the most complicated piece. But sometimes it's the people and the processes involved in implementing that technology that are actually either just as complex or, or potentially more. And I think that that. That idea of giving them space, I, th- I think that's that's yeah, great. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, uh, Florian, thanks so much for joining the show. Um, for those listening, what's the best way for them to keep up with what you and Action IQ are doing? Yeah, so I'm I'm not very present on social networks. Uh, I have to be honest, uh, but I, I I post occasionally on LinkedIn, so you can find me there. You, I'm always available if you want to reach out there. Um, otherwise, you'll see my contributions usually on um, Action IQ's website, so you can. Keep a track, uh, keep an eye on there, uh, or via LinkedIn on Twitter, which are over channels we're using. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, and we're gonna we're gonna link to the, one of the blogs you wrote on on Composable uh, in the show notes as well. So definitely, highly recommend people check that out. So uh, again, I'd like to thank uh, Florian Dalval, Director of Technical Product Marketing Manager at Action IQ, for joining the show. Thanks for listening to the Agile Brand with Greg Kilstrom. Talk with you next week. Thanks again for listening to the Agile Brand with Greg Kilstrom podcast, brought to you by Tech Systems. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to subscribe on your podcast channel of choice and leave us a rating so that others can find the show more easily. You can access more episodes of the show at www.theagilebrand.show. To get a copy of my latest book, Meaningful Measurement of the Customer Experience, visit my website at gregkilstrom.com. Until next week, stay agile.